Hi guys, thanks for joining us here on YouTube. Um, my name's Dave, I'm the pastor over at South Point Community Church, and, uh, and we are uh, ready to go. Um, we're ready to uh, dive back into the book of Philippians, and so I'm really, really glad that you're here with us. Uh, thank you for um, taking the time. I, uh, I have something kind of fun for you. I found this letter, um, I believe it's uh, part of a rare document collection. Um, it's actually a letter to Jesus, uh, son of Joseph, and, um, and it's from the Jordan Management Consultants Group. Um, and this is what it says. Uh, Dear Sir, thank you for submitting the resumes of 12 men you have picked for managerial positions in your new organization. Um, all of them have now taken our battery of tests and we have not only run their results through the computer, but also arranged personal interviews for each of them with our psychologist and vocational aptitude consultant. Uh, the profiles of all the tests are included, and you will want to study each of them carefully. As part of our service, we give some general comments for your guidance, uh, much as an auditor will include some general statements. This is given as a result uh, of staff consultation, and comes without any additional fee. Um, it is the staff's opinion that most of the nominees are lacking background education on vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you are undertaking. They do not have the team concept. Um, we would recommend that you continue to search for persons of experience in managerial ability and proven ca capability. Uh, Simon Peter is emotionally unstable and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no leadership qualities. The brothers, James and John, uh, the uh, sons of Zebedee, uh, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas demonstrates a questioning attitude that would tend to undermine morale. We feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew um, has been blacklisted by the Greater J uh, Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. James, the son of Alphaeus, and Theodeus uh, definitely have radical leanings, and they both register a high score on the manic depressive scale. One of the candidates, however, shows general potential. He is a man of ability and resourcefulness, meets people well, he has a keen business mind, and has contacts in high places. He is highly motivated, ambitious, and responsible. We recommend Judas Iscariot as your controller and right-hand man. All of the other profiles are self-explanatory. We wish you every success in your new venture. Sincerely, the Jordan Management Consultants Incorporated. Now, that's a rare and special document indeed. Um, and it's kind of amusing um, when, uh, uh, when you know this side of the story. Um, but, uh, but it provides some uh, interesting perspective because imagine if um, back in about the year 26 when, uh, when Jesus is recruiting his disciples in the gospel, imagine if there was a consulting company um, that was giving him some input on, on the characters that he had, uh, that he had rounded up. Um, it would be a really different story if somebody else picked the disciples, wouldn't it? And yet, as we read through the Gospels, I think we'll all agree that Jesus' perspective on who should be part of the 12 disciples and each of their roles, um, he, he probably wasn't wrong. Um, he just surprised everybody um, with uh, that particular uh, group of misfits and uh, and what could be accomplished um, by them over over a given uh, period of time. I uh, I wanted to read that to you because um, number one I, I have a feeling that sometimes we don't feel qualified. And as we're looking at the book of Philippians, um, one of the things that the apostle Paul wants to encourage the people in Philippi in is he wants to encourage them in the ministry in Philippi. Um, that God has given them a ministry and has a purpose for their life. Um, and so he's, see, he's trying to encourage them in that direction. And they are probably a bunch of misfits. Um, just all different backgrounds, really. But, um, but 
but like you and I, uh, with their strengths and their weaknesses, and it kind of comes as a, as a package deal. We're going to take a little bit more look at this, um, but, uh, but first I'd like uh, to spend a little bit of time together uh, just praying, and then, uh, and then we'll keep rolling into the book of Philippians. Let's pray. Gracious God, boy, we thank you that you have chosen us. If it was up to a, a head hunting company, I'm not sure that we would make the grade. Um, but you, in your love and grace and kindness, um, have seen something in us, the diamond in the rough. And your willingness, Lord, um, to use us in your plan of salvation, um, your willingness, Lord, to patiently work in our lives and, and shape us into the, the people that, that you desire to see us become. Lord, it is wonderful. As we take this time right now, we submit our hearts and our minds to you, and we ask and pray that you would meet us again through your Spirit and through your Word, um, that you would guide us and direct us and that you would give us both a challenge and an encouragement, for we need it all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are um, in Philippians chapter 2 still. Um, this is our last uh, little kick at the can here for Philippians chapter 2. And, uh, and we're just looking at the last 11 verses. It's a, it's, it's a great passage of Scripture. And as we look at it, um, each week I do a, a little bit more kind of research and, uh, and studying and, uh, and, and, and not to cheat, but every now and then I, I, I go to some pastors that I kind of appreciate and, uh, and see what they've gleaned from, from passages like this. And so Chip Ingram is, uh, is somebody who, uh, who would probably make a really good church consultant. In fact, I think he does do some of that. Um, but he's a neat pastor, and, uh, and, and what I love about Chip is that um, I find he's crystal clear in his communication, and he always gets very practical, and that's super helpful to me. And so I, I, I picked up some material that he had on Philippians and was listening, and, and, I, and I discovered that, uh, that he takes this whole book of Philippians and kind of boils it down to a, a mathematical formula. And he's not a mathematician, I don't think, um, but this is an interesting uh, little formula. He says, C plus P equals E. And he says, that's the whole story of the book of Philippians. What he's talking about is this notion that your circumstances, which are, are often out of your control, it's just they are what they are, um, your circumstances plus your perspective will result in or equal your experience. No, the Apostle Paul was not the only person in a, in a Roman prison, um, but, um, but he had a unique experience there because he approached it from a unique perspective. And that's one of the great things about our perspective is to a significant degree, we get to choose what that is. We don't always get to choose our circumstances. Um, Paul didn't get to choose which guard he happened to be chained to, um, but he did get to choose his perspective, and that dramatically, of course, affected his experience of being a Roman prison, or sorry, a Roman prisoner. So we get to choose our perspective, and this is uh, how Chip suggests that, that we handle that in general. He says, uh, first choose your perspective by looking up towards Jesus perspective means kind of the direction that you look, right? So look up towards Jesus and then choose a perspective that looks out towards others. When we're struggling with our circumstances, typically it's because we're focusing on me, myself, and I. But once we lift our head up towards Christ and once we get outward focused, that changes everything. When you're looking towards others and looking towards Christ, then you'll be able to find joy and hope and meaning, even in the most difficult and desperate situations. For the Apostle Paul, 
in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21, he sort of summarizes and then declares his own perspective. He says, for him, to live is Christ and to die is gain. And it's interesting because he gains when he dies because of Christ, and he knows that. Um, but when he says to live is Christ, he means that outward perspective towards other people is empowered and, 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 and motivated by, by who Christ is in his life and who Christ has inspired and encouraged him to be. Now, I think we can all appreciate that for sure our perspective really does impact our experience. That's something that we've all uh, become familiar with if we've lived a few years on this planet. Um, but the challenging part, of course, is how do you maintain that healthy and positive perspective over a significant amount of time? And especially, Chip observes over what he calls the, the zigzag path of life. The Apostle Paul answers that question too. Um, and, and, and for him, he says one of the things you need to do in order to maintain a positive perspective is you need to look for God's purpose. And not only has he looked for it, but now he's declaring it uh, to all of his friends in Philippi that God had a purpose in him being imprisoned in Philippi, um, and it's more than he could have ever asked or imagined. Sorry, of him being imprisoned in Rome, and it's more than he could have ever asked or imagined. As we discover God's purpose being worked out in our life, that divine purpose easily functions um, as, a, as essentially an anchor for our perspective. However, there's something that I think that we need to appreciate about God's purpose. We tend to see our days as, a, as essentially a journey from A to B, with B being God's purpose, if we're Christians. Um, and and this, uh, this, I think, tends to give us a little bit of hope because, because we think that we can do that journey. You know, we can work through that. If this is God's purpose, then we can move toward it. Uh, but that hope, typically, in most Christians' lives, I think, gets a little undermined as life goes on because life doesn't give us that straight path. Life comes to us with this zigzag pattern, and we start to wonder whether or not we're going to make it to God's purpose. I don't want to make this worse, but it is worse than that. Um, the fact is that, uh, uh, that, that, that B may not even be God's purpose. What if B isn't that grand purpose that we hoped it was going to be when we get there? I mean, it might be a grand purpose for your life or for my life, but it's not a grand purpose for God. What a difference it would actually make for all of us if we could realize God's grand purpose in all of it. I mean, all of it. You see, all of those zigzags, all of those ups, those downs in our life, they're all part of God's plan. God doesn't waste a moment, not a heartbeat. He certainly doesn't waste a hurt or a challenge. Every stumble um, is turned into a lesson, a connection, a deeper understanding, a, a powerful part of, of our witness and testimony. Every victory is a testimony in itself, but really those victories tend to be testimonies to God's grace and glory and His marvelous love for for the likes of us. God is not wasting your time. He's actually, if you'll let him, building your life, and as Christ said in John chapter 10, life to the full, in fact. It has been said, looking at the book of Philippians, that everybody lives in Philippians chapter 21. Everybody, Christian, non-Christian, everybody on the planet lives in Philippians, I think I said chapter 21, I mean Philippians verse 21. It's either a life lived in chapter 1 verse 21, which reads, to live is Christ and to die is gain, or our life is lived out in chapter 2 verse 21, which reads, 
everyone looks after their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul has, uh, has so far, he's tried to demonstrate that God's purpose has been, has been actually um, thriving even though he's in chains in Rome. And just as he demonstrates that God's purpose was marvelously accomplished um, in, in, in the unexpected, most unexpected way uh, through Christ's humble sacrifice on a Roman cross. And now Paul himself turns for his friends in Philippi to a different example. The example of two men that he knows the Philippians can really relate to. Young Timothy and Epaphroditus. So let's listen for a moment to Paul's little discourse here in chapter 2, verses 19 to 30. And, uh, and in advance, I want to thank Emery for reading this for us. Philippians 2, 19-30 Timothy and Epaphroditus I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself. Because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier. He is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed he was ill and almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again you may be, be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor men like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for, for the help you could not give you. Thank you, Emmy. You're awesome. I really appreciate that. Hey, you know, that's an important passage of Scripture that Emery just read for us. And it's important on a few accounts. Um, and yet, to be completely honest, Nobody ever says, hey, my favorite story in the Bible is the one where the Apostle Paul tells about when Epaphrodites got sick and he almost died, but then he didn't die. Um, that's just not the kind of passage of Scripture it is. But the reason why I think it's important is because it demonstrates yet again, <clears throat> similar uh, to what that little, uh, that little letter that I read at the beginning uh, demonstrates. Nobody would have picked the apostles and the disciples um, the way Jesus did um, because they just weren't the cream of the crop. They weren't considered qualified. And yet God taught them through uh, those three years with Jesus something that changed their lives totally. And that was simply the love of Christ. The love of Christ is what transformed their lives. Becoming aware that, that God was not only their creator, but their biggest fan, and that he had a plan. That kind of rhymes. I'm happy about that. It changed everything. And when you look at uh, these two characters here in this passage at the end of chapter 2, Timothy and Epaphroditus um, have this in common. They are normal. They're normal. They're not even great. I, I, I hate to put that judgment on them. Um, I just, uh, just kind of would probably put myself right in the same category. So, so I'm, I'm not trying to be mean. Uh, Timothy uh, comes from kind of an awkward background. He grew up in a place called Lystra. And uh, it was a Roman garrison. Um, his mother was a Jewish person uh, or a Hebrew person. But his dad was a Gentile. 
back in that day, that's just not popular. Um, so, uh, so he's got a lot going against him, um, no matter what circles he tries to travel in, until the Apostle Paul sees this diamond in the rough, a young man who needs um, the love of Christ in a tangible way in his life. Um, and interestingly enough, in her hard times and in her struggles, um, Timothy's mom and grandmother had been, had been teaching Timothy the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures. So there was a good base there. Um, it just needed a little help. And the Apostle Paul eagerly um, identified with Timothy and took him under his wing almost as an adopted father or an adopted son. Timothy, at the time of the book of Philippians, is, is probably about 33 years old. Um, that's interesting to me because this is about the same age that Jesus um, died. And, and yet, um, and yet if, if, if this is Paul's first imprisonment in Rome, and then he leaves, and then he ends up in Rome um, again, uh, that's one timeline for the book of Philippians. Another timeline is that, uh, is that this is it's one and done for the Apostle Paul, um, and that Timothy did leave, um, as he describes here, and then uh, a little later, as things got a little uh, closer to the end for the Apostle Paul, he writes Timothy two letters that we have um, in, the, in the New Testament here, First and Second Timothy, before he dies. But in those letters, you hear a couple more things about Timothy um, that are interesting. At age 33 plus, um, he's still timid enough that Paul has to remind him not to let his youthfulness um, get in the way of, of being a good Bible teacher, of being a good pastor. Paul has to remind him um, not to be such a prude. Um, Timothy's struggling with a sore stomach, and Paul says, hey, take a little wine for your stomach, um, because... Just practically speaking, um, water is not always uh, the easiest thing uh, to come across, good water. Uh, Timothy, when, uh, when Paul writes those two letters to him, is struggling because there's a lot of false teachers uh, in the church that, that he's overseeing. And, and Paul essentially says, look, Timothy, you're, you're letting these guys run right over you. You can't allow them to just talk when what they're saying is nonsense you, you have to you have to be a little stronger so so what recommendation does the apostle paul have to the philippians that timothy's the right guy to come and encourage them his recommendation is right here in uh, in verse 20 i have no one else like him who will Show genuine concern for your welfare. The contrasting verse there, verse 21, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And so, as you connect those two uh, verses in their contrast, what's parallel is that when Timothy's looking out and showing an interest for the Philippians' welfare, he's, what he's really doing is is putting an interest in what Christ Jesus is interested in. So Philip, or sorry, so Timothy is a good pastor in Paul's opinion, because he's learned the most important lesson: Jesus cares about people and all the people. What about Epaphroditus? Epaphroditus gets high praise here. Um, and what does he get high praise for? In, uh, in, in verse 29, it says, So then, welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor people like him, because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. What, what help is all of that, right? Who's Epaphrodites? We don't know if Epaphrodites is young or old, I'm going to call him a messenger boy. Um, I suspect that he was either on the young side or on the elderly side, or possibly um, had some medical condition uh, and frailty about him that made him a good choice to be a messenger. 
he's either strong enough to travel um, the trip from Philippi to the city of Rome, or he's weak enough that nobody's going to bother him because he doesn't seem like the kind of person who would have anything to steal. Um, Epaphrodites is, um, is, is the person that can be freed up to go to Rome for weeks at, at minimum, because the trip is that long, um, maybe for months, possibly for years, if the Apostle Paul wants to keep him around um, and let him continue to help out. So who's the guy when you're running a carpenter shop and the carpenter shop happens to be the family business that you can spare, right? That's Epaphrodites. And yet the Apostle Paul gives him high praise. Why? Because he did what he could for the sake of the gospel. I know I need to wrap up, um, but I'm excited about this. I'm excited about the fact that God has a plan for every single person that has ever been born, that will ever be born, and certainly for every person I'm talking to on this video. He has a plan for you. He knows you and he cares about you. You can go scripture passage after scripture passage after scripture passage, and you will see the zigzag pattern in people's lives and understand that what we read sometimes on one page for them was one year or one decade of their life, right? And there's some really challenging stuff here in the scriptures, and yet God is faithful and he gets them through and he uses people in spite of their weaknesses. Sometimes he just uses their weaknesses. Um, and, and it turns out that he's given everybody something. Lazarus was Jesus' really good friend. And apparently, uh, the great thing Lazarus could do was get sick and die. Um, and then God used that um, so that Lazarus could be raised from the dead. These guys are normal. Um, but they were willing to, with Paul, set their perspective to look up and to look out. To look to who Jesus Christ was and to look out towards those Jesus cared so much about. They were willing to patiently, with eyes of faith, anchor themselves in the purpose of God. And they got to live an adventure with the Apostle Paul. It's not just for Bible times. It's for right now. And so I do want to ask, you know, Silly question. Can you do that? Can we do that? Can we encourage one another to submit our, our hearts and our lives to the care and control of Christ Jesus and to trust Him in all the zigzags and the ups and the downs of life to have a purpose that will be meaningful and even wonderful and to pursue that purpose with all the strength and grace that God provides. Let's pray about it. Father, I thank you that you are so patient and yet so willing um, to engage. And where we give you an inch, Lord, you take it all, um, and you move and work in our midst in miraculous ways. You don't seem to mind the time it takes, and I'm slightly under the impression that that's because you enjoy spending time with us. And so help us, Lord, to be patient in the process, but to keep our eye on you, and to be diligent as we pursue a perspective that honors you, glorifies you, puts you at the center, and helps us to see the world the way you see it. Please, Lord, help us to get anchored in the personal purpose that you have for our lives, big or small. 
and help us again and again and again, moment after moment, to just say yes to you as you prompt us and move us in the direction of this little thing we call thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, especially in our life. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thank you very much, guys. God bless.